A few people messaged me on the channel page asking about yet another video doing the rounds of social media. Top 5 Climate Myths by Stephen Crowder I don't know why this has become so popular, but the fact that several people cited the same thing made me think it would be worth doing a short video on it. So here goes. Unless you accept all of those points wholesale, you are labelled a science denier by the same people who often push the idea that gender is merely a figment of your imagination. Well, I don't accept all these points wholesale, Steve, and I'm certainly not a science denier or someone who thinks gender is a figment of one's imagination. As I've said before on my channel, the word denier is itself derogatory and unscientific. But if we take the politics, subjectivity and emotion out of these statements, then yes, I do accept them. The Earth is warming. I accept that the Earth is warming. Number two, that humans are the primary cause of it. I'm not going to accept that humans are the primary cause, because that leads to all kinds of emotional arguments about religion and guilt and it's all our fault or it's not our fault. Critics of climate science point out that the Earth's climate has been changing for millions of years before humans came along, and they've got a good point. So if we just strip this down to the science, the evidence shows that the cause of warming is increased levels of carbon dioxide. Number three, that it will have catastrophic results. But you don't define what catastrophic means, Steve. One man's catastrophe is another man's minor inconvenience. So again, let's go with what's been published in the scientific literature, which strips out emotional adjectives and just deals with the quantifiable consequences of global warming, mainly higher sea levels, stronger hurricanes, increased salination, drought and flood, coastal erosion and acidification of the oceans. And most importantly, number four, that the only entity competent and fit to stop these results is the United States government or some international form of government. Well, obviously, you can't be a science denier if you don't think the solution lies in more government control, because that's a matter of opinion and politics, not science. So before you start arguing about the best solution for an issue that you say doesn't exist, perhaps the first step should be to accept the science. Maybe you believe all of these points, and that's fine. I want to hear from you in the comments section. Well, at the request of a few of my subscribers, you're hearing from me in this video. Hi. Now, if you still don't accept the science with all the politics and subjectivity stripped out, then you're still not a science denier, Steve, but you are someone who prefers to believe what he reads in blogs rather than accept what's published in the scientific literature. So here goes. Consensus. 97% of scientists agree on climate change. As I've said many times, science isn't decided by consensus. After all, not all scientists agree that the Earth is billions of years old, or that animals evolved, or that HIV causes AIDS. But sorry, Steve, what do you say? That science isn't determined by consensus, it's determined by truth. There might have been consensus that the Earth was flat among certain circles. Truth revealed that it wasn't. Yes, he's absolutely right. It's not determined by consensus. Although, come on, it's not determined by revealed truth either. Science isn't religion, so it's determined by evidence, what's known as observation and inference. Scientific theories get accepted and made part of the teaching curriculum not because most scientists vote for them, but because they're supported by what's called the overwhelming preponderance of evidence, which is published in respected scientific journals. I explained this last year in my video, Scientific Consensus and Arguments from Authority, so if you're curious to know why some hypotheses get accepted and others fall by the wayside, then take a look. And if you don't like the system, don't blame me, I'm just telling you how it works. And it does work, because it's shown us the link between natural selection and evolution, between HIV and AIDS, plate tectonics and earthquakes, and yes, carbon dioxide and global temperature. You can't praise the method for giving us the theories you like and then say the method doesn't work when it gives us a theory you don't like. But on the question of whether these theories are decided by consensus, they're not. And no poll of scientists, whoever that might be, has ever been taken. So I agree, Steve. This myth is busted. Myth number two. The ice sheets are melting. Truth. The Antarctic ice sheets are actually growing by billions of tons per year. Yes, that's according to a study by NASA. It says Antarctic ice is growing by 82 billion tons a year. And, of course, researchers have a very good idea as to why that's happening. But, of course, there are two major ice sheets on Earth. One is Antarctica, the other is Greenland. 
So now, let's hear the figure for Greenland. According to the new analysis of satellite data, the Antarctic ice sheet showed a net gain of 112 billion tons of ice per year from 1992 to 2001. Actually, the most recent figure is 82 billion tons a year, which you'll mention in a minute. But now give us the figure for the Earth's other ice sheet on Greenland so we can work out the net figure and see whether the myth is true or not. So where does the myth come from that the ice sheets are melting? The net gain, net gain being the key words, slowed down to only 82 billion tons. Yeah, of Greenland, year, Steve, you still haven't given us the figure for Greenland. I know what you're thinking. Okay, numbers are relative. No, and billions, I'm thinking, why do you like? only give us the figure for one ice sheet that happens to fit your narrative that ice sheets aren't melting, but you won't give us the figure for the other ice sheet? So I'll do it myself. While Antarctica may be gaining ice to the tune of 82 billion tonnes a year, Greenland is losing ice to the tune of 269 billion tonnes a year. In other words, on a global scale, the ice sheets are indeed melting away at the rate of around 187 billion tonnes a year. That's a net melt of 187 cubic kilometres of ice every year. And if we add in glaciers and sea ice, the net melt is even larger. So where does the myth come from that the ice sheets are melting? Well, Steve, it comes from an appraisal of measurements taken of both ice sheets, not just the one you happen to read because it's been copied and pasted on the blogosphere. It comes from people who read the scientific literature, not blogs. And it comes from NASA, the people whose results you believe for Antarctica, but quietly ignore in Greenland. It comes from people who want to see the whole picture, not just a part of the picture that suits their preconceived beliefs. That's where the myth comes from, and that's why this myth is very definitely confirmed. Myth! The polar bears are dying off! Okay. So what? Truth! There are possibly more of these soulless, killing monsters on Earth today than ever, certainly since we've begun monitoring them. What's that got to do with the issue of whether the Earth is warming, whether carbon dioxide is the cause, and whether it'll cause stronger hurricanes, increased salination, droughts and floods and sea level rise, and acidification of the oceans and fewer coral reefs and more coastal erosion? These are the myths you're supposed to be busting. But OK, let's take a look anyway. Crowder tells us to go to his website for his source, which I did. It's a blog called factcheck.org. It says there has indeed been a rise in polar bear numbers since the 1970s, due mainly to legislation banning polar bear hunting. And it also says many scientists believe that due to climate change and resulting environmental factors, the trend is reversing. Now remember, this is Crowder's source, and funnily enough, he never mentioned any of this. Crowder's other source from which he got this graph is, of course, another blog. The blogger thinks numbers may be increasing, and she could be right. My policy is not to believe everything I read in blogs. But both of Crowder's sources agree on one thing. We simply don't know for sure. That's not my assessment. I haven't got a clue either. That's the assessment of the blog's Crowder sites. So despite his revealed truth that polar bear numbers are increasing, we can chalk that myth down to don't know. And as far as the question of whether carbon dioxide is the cause of global warming is concerned, the number of polar bears is totally irrelevant. Myth number four. Our current climate models are accurate. Crowder doesn't actually address the myth he set up, but he does talk about a variety of other things. We rely on a few organizations for these predictions, one of which is NOAA. They can't even accurately predict how many hurricanes there will be this year in Florida. That's right, they can't. What a shame that wasn't the myth. The over 300 scientists are imploring lawmakers to investigate NOAA. Well, not quite. The list includes Christopher Moncton, who's a politician, and John Coleman, who graduated in media studies, and, of course, Tim Ball, who claims once again to have been a professor of climatology, when, in fact, he was a professor of geography. But anyway, these people claim NOAA wrongly adjusted temperature data in this 2015 paper. So why didn't these 300 signatories simply write a response paper pointing out what they saw as flaws in the NOAA methodology? Who knows, whatever the reason, this still isn't the myth Crowder tasked himself with busting. So many predictions being wrong, including, by the way, nearly all of the predictions made in Al Gore's Oscar-nominated An Inconvenient Truth. Mistakes in Al Gore's movie is evidence that climate research has got things wrong. Seriously, Steve? Which predictions to rattle off a few like Mount Kilimanjaro as we address the polar bears? North Pole still has ice. But you can't then make the leap that because people get things wrong in the public media, that the science must therefore be wrong. 
Researchers can't be held responsible for the mistakes made by Al Gore and environmentalists any more than they can be held responsible for the mistakes made by the bloggers you use as sources. But you can go back to the 70s and find other doomsday predictions, like global cooling. But again, what's that got to do with climate researchers? Never mind the predictions made by movies, books, magazines, and individuals with the scientific acumen of cheese whiz, let's deal with the predictions of real, actual climate researchers, as published in the scientific literature. Isn't that what you're trying to prove is wrong? The vast majority of published papers in the 1960s and 70s were predicting warming, not cooling, by a margin of 44 to 7. And the reason they gave for this predicted warming was increasing levels of CO2. Due to our release through factories and automobiles every year of more than 6 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide, which helps air absorb heat from the sun, our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. This is bad. Well, it's been calculated a few degrees rise in the Earth's temperature would melt the polar ice caps. That isn't a recent propaganda message from Greenpeace. It was an educational film shown in schools and colleges in 1958. And of course, those predictions have proved 100% accurate. Ice sheets, glaciers and sea ice are melting, and the rate of melt is accelerating. Temperatures have been rising to record levels, even when increased pollution and lower solar output should have been sending temperatures lower. And while we all tend to focus on atmospheric temperatures, remember that climate scientists look at the Earth as a whole. 90% of the extra heat is going into the oceans, which have also fulfilled the predictions of warming. The only thing climate models can't do is predict short-term changes, because in the short term there are lots of minor fluctuations that affect measurements like temperature and sea level. It's like me trying to predict on January the 1st in Denver whether the temperature on February the 1st will be warmer or colder. It's almost impossible. But looking further into the future, it gets easier, and I can confidently predict that the temperature in Denver will be higher in May and much higher in July. That's because over short periods of time, the increasing warming of the sun may not overcome short-term fluctuations. But over a longer period of time, these background fluctuations become less significant. And while temperatures may go up and down on a daily or even weekly basis, I can confidently predict that every month in Denver between January and July is going to be warmer on average than the previous one. So what climate models can do, and have done very successfully, is predict the long-term trend. When geologists applied the model to the past 500 million years, it fit almost perfectly with the continuous changes in the Earth's climate. Geologists discovered that changing levels of carbon dioxide explained nearly all the long-term changes in temperature. The model explained the so-called faint sun paradox. That's the problem of why the Earth was much hotter than today at a time when the sun was much, much weaker. It was because CO2 levels were many times higher than today. The model explained why the Earth escaped from a deep freeze during the Precambrian. It was because of a slow accumulation of carbon dioxide from volcanoes. The model explained why the Earth has maintained a Goldilocks climate ever since, because as the Sun has been getting increasingly hotter, the high levels of carbon dioxide have gradually been taken out of the atmosphere and buried as limestone, coal and oil. And the model solved the problem of why the Earth warmed so much after each glaciation, given that the increased insulation that sparked them wasn't strong enough to melt the ice sheets. In fact, the climate model works so well that carbon dioxide is being called the Earth's thermostat and the long-term regulator of the Earth's climate. We even understand the mechanism by which carbon dioxide can do this. It's in peer-reviewed research papers going back over a hundred years, when it was first discovered that carbon dioxide absorbs long-wave radiation. And a physicist calculated as far back as the 19th century that if the carbon dioxide level ever got high enough, it could affect the Earth's climate. Talk about a prescient prediction! So, notwithstanding the fact that Al Gore and assorted environmentalists often make wacky predictions that are wrong, as far as researchers in the field of glaciology, atmospheric physics, oceanography, geology, paleoclimatology, and all the other assorted disciplines that have built up this model are concerned, this myth is confirmed. National or international government is the only entity capable of solving imminent climate change catastrophe. Well, as I said at the beginning, that's not only a political question, it's tackling a problem that you say doesn't exist. 
So here's my suggestion for your next video, Steve. Address the issues you put up at the beginning. Is the Earth warming? Is carbon dioxide from fossil fuel burning the cause? Will the result be higher sea levels, stronger hurricanes, increased salination, drought and flood, acidification of the oceans and coastal erosion? These are the things that matter to us because they'll affect our food supply, our infrastructure and most importantly, our wallets. That matters more to people than the number of bloody polar bears. Put these questions up as myths and see if you can bust them. But don't just cite a blog and tell people Fred Blogger doesn't believe it, so that proves it's not true. You're an intelligent man. Dig a little deeper. Check the blogger's source and verify it. Find out what the science says by checking the scientific literature and see if there's a discrepancy or an explanation of why the blogger might have got his facts wrong. Look at all the evidence, not just the bits that give you the answer you want. With the deepest respect, talking louder doesn't mean you're better informed.